Left school at 16, but at that time in the 1960s, you, most people went into the pots and it was because there was somebody in the pottery industry that you knew, your mother, your father, your sister, your uncle, they got your job. They had a class of people that when you were with them, they, you were friendly, especially the ladies. You, st you felt like that you were all together as a family, looking out for each other, very much so in the pottery industry. We just enjoyed it. You can't really say it was work. You were all somehow connected. We all had a laugh. You can't sit just painting and not have a laugh. Every time that you needed anything, you could call upon any of those ladies and they'd all help you out. This is what people don't understand that have never worked in pot banks. Everybody looks out for each other and you're like a little family. It was terrible when it was all made redundant, you know, and, and factories closed. There were factories that had gone for years and that was all that people knew. It was friendly. I love the pottery industry, I love the pottery people. You're looking back over the years and you see how, how the changes have gone over the years. Looking back at my mother when she was a girl and when I was a, a girl, I was proud to be a pot bank worker. Hundreds of years of manufacturing brilliance, world-leading innovation and breathtakingly beautiful design is an integral part of the fabric of the potteries. Stoke-on-Trent is one of the few cities affectionately named after the product that it's famous for, but ceramics is more than pots and dishes. It's a unique combination of artistry and engineering. Arguably, the manufacturing industry where women have been the most influential and an essential component to the cultural and economic DNA of this area of North Staffordshire. This film tells the story of the critical role women have played to the success of an industry where all of the women are bound together by the clay. From conception to completion, we celebrate the heritage, the skills, the lives and the camaraderie of these women in the workplace. Women have always had quite an important role in the ceramics industry. When it was first a cottage industry, you often see women working alongside the rest of their families as a way of supplementing the family income. And then as the industry really takes off and develops, again, women are still provide quite a large proportion of um, the total workforce in North Staffordshire. I think there has always been a recognised need for women to work in the ceramics industry in North Staffordshire. If you look back historically, even um, as late as 1904, there was an account by a factory inspector who said that women were looked on as being lazy if they didn't contribute to the family income by going to work, particularly in the ceramics industry, because at that time the other jobs in the area, like the mining, didn't bring in sufficient income. Without women in the pottery factories, the factories wouldn't have operated. It's as simple as that. From the late 18th century onwards, we know that there were a lot of women in, working in the factories, predominantly at first at the decorating end, but increasingly at the making end. You see, in the 18th and the 19th centuries, and really right up until the First World War, there was very little mechanisation in pottery making. The wheels were turned by hand power. Now, initially, those were children because they were the cheapest labour and the work was comparatively unskilled. But as they were increasingly taken out of the workforce, as compulsory education came in, so they had to be replaced, and they were replaced by women, because they were the next cheapest form of labour. And so without those women, the pots wouldn't have been made. During the First World War, the potteries really couldn't have carried on if it hadn't been for women stepping up and stepping into the roles that the men had been carrying out. And they did it very well. Their, their wages went up as well. The unions were very concerned that if women were seen to be doing men's skilled work at a lower rate of pay, then nobody would want the men in those jobs when they came back from the war. So women's wages went up tremendously, which was great. Of course, when the men came back, in many cases, they took over those roles again and women lost out. 
but in some cases they certainly did continue in those roles. All of a sudden a huge proportion of your male and relatively young workforce just disappear overnight and all of a sudden you have these gaps in the ceramics industry that men have traditionally done. There are particularly sort of male dominated parts in the ceramic factory like working on the kilns for instance or in the warehouses which are often very very male centric. With the Great War there are gaps and women increasingly are brought in to fill these gaps. So within Wedgwood um, we lose a quarter of our workforce um, to the military um, during the First World War. So you see women, whereas they've perhaps been assistants to the men, say as the turners or the potter's assistants, they often become the main potters, the main turners and so on. Um, women also, not necessarily within Wedgwood, but um, further afield, say at um, Grimwades, they actually take over the kilns and they're a very famous example of the Grimwade girls who actually have special lifting equipment in order to help them sort of get the goods into the kilns because it's heavy, dirty work. Um, and there are sort of newspaper articles proclaiming, you know, how much work and how good the Grimway girls are in doing this. Without women during this period, you know, many of these big companies would have just sort of ground to a halt. And there is a train of thought that actually within the ceramics industry within North Staffordshire, women actually assimilated better into these job roles because they had such a long history of working directly alongside the men. It was just a matter of just sort of being in charge rather than being the assistant. But certainly without them being there, companies like Wedgwood and the numerous other ceramic companies in the area would not have carried on during the war. During the Second World War, the government put great restrictions on what could be made, where it could be made and who could make it. A number of factories were closed down altogether for the duration of the war. They couldn't make decorated ware for the home market. It was not seen as being necessary. Decorated ware was made for export and that was really important to bring in hard currency to keep the war going. But you don't need to have flowers on your teacups. And so anything that was made for the domestic market was undecorated. And that meant an awful lot of women, as well as men, were then released to work in the forces and in other supporting industries, the munitions industry, for example. In the First World War, the women stepped up and took on the men, men's roles. In the Second World War, they were both being released from pottery making to help the war effort. I first started for Wedgwoods, it was called Crown Staffordshire at the time uh, uh, in Fenton, but Wedgwoods took over. Wedgwoods and Dalton and, and Minton's took over a lot of the little pottery factories as the years went by. Uh, you were probably made redundant from one, but set on at another place. When you left school and you went in the pottery industry, you didn't go and say, oh, I'd like to be a, a lithographer or I'd like to be a paintress. You went and whatever job was available at the time, you took and they taught you your trade. And it was just wherever it was needed really. And so wherever I was needed, I used to, used to just say, Jennifer, can you come do this, help out and do this? And, and I used to do it like so. I mean, I did have to learn to do the things that I was doing before I could just sit down and do it. I mean, you couldn't just say, can you go do some biscuit selecting? I got to learn learn how to do it for you know and different things but I really enjoyed doing what I was doing. I started at Colport in Stoke 1968. I was just 15 years of age. I'd got three aunties that already worked on there and they kept saying come down and have a look and I said I can't do what you do I'm not artistic. So eventually I said okay I'll come and have a look and I was greeted at the door by the forelady, lady in charge they used to be called Mrs. just before I joined, and she sat me down at a, a wooden bench with ten other ladies on it. She gave me a bowl, she mixed the colours on a glass tile, and she said, you have a go after I've painted this rose, see what you think while I go do a job over there. And as soon as I put that colour on the flowers, I knew that's what I wanted to do, and I've been basically doing it ever since. Because there were so many jobs in that, you know, that time, you could pick and choose where you wanted to go. I only worked for nine years in the pottery industry, you know, but it was between those fundamental you know, times for a young woman. Because you learn so much in, in that particular time, you know, it's not just learning a job or you know, a skill, it's all the people that are around you. I left school at 15. I, um, I wanted to be a hairdresser. But in them days, you had to pay. You had to pay the hairdresser for teaching you. 
So I said to my mum, uh, she said, what do you want to be when you leave school? I said, I want to be a hairdresser. She says, no, you're going on a pop bank and you'll bring some money in this house. I said, OK, but it hasn't done me badly. I've enjoyed myself. I worked with, I got a gun that you poured glaze in and uh, sprayed all the different colours and it had to be even, done evenly. I saw it had all come back and you'd have to repair it and alter it. Uh, and it was standing all day. And when you'd, you're in a hood and it, the a motor was going to try and take the dust away, but evidently it didn't take it all away. And then you'd put it on, there was a, at the side of you, there was like a trestle with a six foot board across and you filled that board taking it from this side to this, and then lifted the board and put it on a truck with four wheels. It, it held um, eight or ten boards. Then you had to, when it was full, you had to push it to the kill where they fired it in the kill. It gradually got better. They started having labourers to help us. But it was very hard work till uh, we had them, you know. We had an hour uh, lunch then, so we used to run along to the park and eat a sandwich and then come back, and that was nice because we, we all went if it was in the summer, and, and that was nice. And then gradually they cut the lunch time down to three quarters and then half an hour, it wasn't a long enough break when you're on a heavy, when you're doing a heavy job, uh, you just had time walk to the canteen, have a cup of tea and a sandwich, and rush back, and then it's, it's all lifting all day. I started off as a young girl working by hand. Uh, we used to have to make his own roll of clay to put the dish on. I'd have to make my own tools, and, and another as well. We we had what they call a missus. A missus over the shop, and you respected her as a, a missus over the shop. The women run the pot banks, really. The women looked after the makers. It was piecework, so you could earn as much money as you wanted, which was in the 60s was, you know, revolutionary, really, for a young girl. Piecework is a price per piece, and you'd have, say, 10 of one thing, which would be priced at, say, 20 pence each. And you'd have 10 of something else, which would be priced at 30 pence each. So when you'd finish that order, then prices for each piece would go up to make your wages each day. And that would be your week's wages at the end of the week. It, it was serious business, because you, you knew that if you worked hard, you know, you, you would see it in your wage packet, in your little brown envelope on a Friday. But the main thing, you know, then, because uh, I'd got two, two girls at home, was uh, the money, really. You went to earn a living and, uh, you know, you had to do piecework. So th uh, there was that in it as well. And, of course, the men, I think, I might get in trouble with saying this, but they had all the best figures. <laughs> <laughs> because they said, well, we were the, you know, the ones that had uh, needed to eat for the families because they were the, the, the earners, you see. I think they used to come up with the idea that um, the women had got little hands so they could do the balloons. Well, we painted with a brush. It didn't quite have big hands. <laughs> oh, I loved it. It was ace. It was ace, but it did cause a lot of trouble. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously it's an intensive, so the more money, the more work you do, the more money you're given. So therefore you, you're really trying hard, but yeah, if there's some, when I was a glass selector, for example, I argued every day with my colleagues, every day, because everybody wants the best work, eh? And if it's not shared out properly, ah, oh, the arguments, <laughs> every day. When I went back to the potteries um, to do a study there of um, industrial decline and regeneration, 
A lot had happened in the pottery since I did my first research in the early 1980s. And so many pottery factories had closed down then and people had lost their jobs. And it didn't seem to me it was being reported in the newspapers. It was just sort of ignored, really. And I contacted people I'd known in the 1980s in various ways and also knew people who'd worked in the industry since. They'd all, of course, lost their jobs. None of them were working in the pottery industry anymore. I was very interested in women and work. And through a friend of a friend, I got very interested in the pottery industry. So I went to Beswick's first of all for six weeks and 14 months later, I was still there. And the thing is, when you go in a pottery factory, it's just the most, for me, was an amazing experience. You just have this sense of a collective endeavour. And there are all these people there doing different jobs, different trades, in the making department, in the decorating department, aerographing, designing, modelling, packing, the kill men, people in the slip house. The whole range of trades are there. And they're all working together, a collective endeavour. Um, and they're amazing people, men and women. You know, the um, Potter's novelist Arnold Bennett, who really knew Potter's people. I mean, he says, people of the Potter's are the kindest, most generous-hearted people you can meet. And I think that's absolutely true. And they'd got these wonderful skills. Um, every job, really, they were craftsmen and craftswomen. I mean, sometimes Potter's people... If, if they have a fault, it's that they're far too modest. And there are times they don't recognise, I think, always, quite how skilled they are. For me personally, I loved it because I loved the, the big factory atmosphere. You'd always got a good relationship with most of the people there. I was the youngest one there to start with. The older girls, they were 19, 20, 21 year olds. All I wanted to do was to be like them. They come in on a Friday with their little bags and they got rollers and shampoo and scarves. And Friday dinner time, they go to the toilets and in the sinks wash each other's hair, put the rollers in and sit singing away in the afternoon with the scarves on, ready to go out on the night. Everybody was so friendly. Everybody looked after each other. Lots of camaraderie, the, uh, very helpful, working as a team. It's like a little family. Um, everybody did everything for each other, helped each other. We were very close-knit. They were, they were all like one sister. They all used to help one another. And same as if somebody couldn't finish the work off, they'd say, well, I'll finish that off for you. You go and do something else. And you'd, that's what you'd do. Even if you were piece work, you did that. You got to know each, each and everybody and uh, you were just like a happy family, really. When you were first training, it was serious. If you, you weren't capable of doing what they wanted, then they'd have probably taken you out and you'd have gone into another department. But once you were doing the job, uh, everything became very easy. Everybody helped each other. And, the, you know, the, like the younger people would help the older people if they um, hadn't completed their task for that morning. I used to like earning a certain amount of money, you know, say it was £200 or, or what have you, just according to what I'd done in the week. And I used to think, well, that's enough. So probably for an hour, we'd fool around, you know, and have a bit of fun or go to the toilets and have a cigarette or anything like that, you know. But he didn't mind as long as you, you, you did your count. We all used to go out. Um, we used to go out on a Thursday night um, because it was payday on a Thursday, so we'd all go out on Thursday night. And the factory where I worked on, we used to go up to the Adulty in Burslem, and we'd get a minibus over, and, and we'd all go there, and we'd be, as you can imagine, quite late coming in. So we used to get some flowers done the, on the Thursday, ready to start on the Friday morning, because we were all a bit hungover by the Friday morning. Well, we had the local pub, which was on the corner of the, the street, so every lunchtime, not every lunchtime, but people would usually go in there. Um, certainly on a Friday lunchtime, people would end up in the Dew Drop in Hanley. We always used to go there. Anybody's birthday, whether it was the 21st, the 30th, whatever, we used to have a good night out. Um, usually the whole department would go. 
depends on how many was working in the department, but yeah, it, it used to be fun. And certainly at Christmas time, Christmas time was epic on, on, on the factory. It was good fun. One of the things that gets commented about, particularly in the late 19th and the early 20th century, is before, F, before the radio was introduced, is that there was often singing in the workshops. Uh, Stoke-on-Trent's got a very strong tradition of community singing and hymn singing and so forth. And people would walk past the factories and hear the girls singing at their work. Of course, once they brought the radios in and those were playing, um, that's tended to stop and the factory owners were very happy to introduce radios because they found that the um, uh, rate of productivity went up, people were chatting rather less. Now, of course, everybody's plugged into their own personal systems, which is rather a shame. There was always singing. There was always singing. It, you know, one woman would start off and then it did. And the, people, would, you know, people in different departments would hear and they'd all come through and, you know, somebody would say, oh, a request, will you sing me this, will you sing me that? It was, a, it, was, it was a choir, you know what I mean? They loved that. And, of course, we also talked, we had debates, um, you know, about everything, um, you know, from the Beatles to the Union. Everybody talked about things and everybody said what they want. In the factory in Stoke, we all used to take little radios and we'd have sing, sing song. But then when they'd expanded, the ladies had got too many radios going on different stations. So the manager said, we won't have uh, everybody bringing separate radios in. We'll have um, tannoy and we'll have music over the tannoy. Couple hours in the morning, couple in the afternoon. So we used to sing along to that instead. But a lot of the ladies asked me if I'd lived before because I used to know a lot of the wartime songs that they all sung, you know, when I first started at 15, 16. But my mum used to sing them to me when I was a little girl. I said, no matter, no matter what you do, I only want to be with you. post-war, men were coming home, women were having babies, they were staying home and the potteries were really struggling to get, they needed the women back to work and so they ran a, a competition for Pottery's Princess. The factories were asked to nominate uh, uh, women to go forward for this and uh, Jane won. She was very pretty, um, auburn hair, bright blue eyes, um, five foot two, um, with an infectious smile. Her photographs were taken and went on all the wear going out, uh, particularly abroad, America, Canada, everywhere else, with a picture of her uh, to try and encourage sales. But locally, it was a big poster. Now, I can't remember what, what it said on it, but it certainly wasn't your country needs you, <laughs> but it was something to do with this. And I was coming home from school one day, I'd be about six, I was walking from school in Fenton and they were putting up this huge, huge uh, picture. They were pasting up on one of the, the boards near to Fenton Library. And uh, I just stood and smiled and I said, oh, that's my Jane, that's my sister. And the man put it up, says, yes, and she's my auntie, bugger off. <laughs> And, um, uh, and there was, uh, it was uh, something under there about them uh, come back, you know, coming back to work. It gave her a higher profile and she started to worry about working conditions. Um, and so she went to the North Stafford Hospital and trained as an industrial nurse. And for many years, until she retired, she was the industrial nurse uh, at Spode. My sister was very aware that the conditions were very bad uh, for people to work in, um, the chest complaints and so on, um, deaths. I remember my mother-in-law died at the age of 60. She'd actually worked somewhere, I can't remember where, in the clay end. Uh, but she had horrendous chest complaints before she died at the age of 60. I mean, the women worked in the clay, and it wasn't all just men, um, uh, with um, all dust and whatever clay flying around. Um, 
and I'm quite sure that contributed to, to the early deaths in a lot of people um, because they were breathing in, even, even if they were, they wouldn't wear them. I know Jane did say this, she said she got tired of telling people that they gave them, you know, they must wear masks and things, and they, especially the men wouldn't wear them. How many women worked with you in the pottery factories? There was a lot of women that were there, wasn't it? It was nearly all ladies. Predominantly women, yes. There was lots of jobs that the men wouldn't do, you know, because we, we sat at a bench and you were piecework and you, you'd got to produce so many pieces a day and it was tedious and just sitting there, a lot of men wouldn't really want to do that. We had um, nurseries for young children here, a lot of nurseries within Stoke-on-Trent compared to the rest of Stafford and that was because they needed the women in to work and so that they, they had to provide the, the nursery care so that, that they could go out to work. Well the women generally um, were very open and friendly with each other and really in a way quite supportive. I loved it when I was working in the pottery industry. We made loads and loads of friends and uh, we'd go to the pub as well, <laughs> which you did in those days. You met them after work, you know, and they'd know all your family, how many children you'd got, and lots of your, fa your family worked on the pottery as well, and your mum would work there, your dad, so you, you've got to behave yourself, otherwise you'd soon get back to them. <laughs> Were there any um, romances in the factory? I think quite a lot of people met the partners. Although it's predominantly women working in the pottery industry, um, the men were in good supply and, uh, and relationships um, formed. <laughs> and, and one or two that we weren't, we weren't supposed to know about. <laughs> <laughs> the women were incredibly independent and so we're all piecework. So they had, also have to have stamina. I mean, you go in in the morning, you're paid for every 10, say, that you make, you know, at the end of the day, how much you've earned. So they went in there to make their money. I mean, they were craftspeople and they were, you know, if they were patresses, they had artistry, as they used to say, in their fingers. But they were women who were very committed to their families and they w worked hard and they went in to make their money. The majority of the workforce, a lot of the skills, they were women. A lot of the kind of manual work was, was done by the men. The women ran the show. The women, you know, the supervisors, you know, the, the, it was unusual to see a man, other than in management. But the women kept the place going. And it was empowering because you could see women earning money. Women ruled. <laughs> women ruled. The men were the scared ones, even the bosses. The women just ruled all the time, so. We could kick off or moan about something and perhaps the big boss would come down and, you know, and try and sort us out. But usually, nine times out of ten, the women rule the roost. But it was always men telling you what to do and when to do it. And we let them think, yes, we were listening, but when they'd gone, we did it our way and our way was the way they wanted it. But they thought... That was what they'd said. I was a child through the 50s, just after the war. Money wasn't available as such, you know. So to, to reach 16, you know, and go straight into a job where they were paying you a good wage, and within six months, like for me, because I was very good at what I did, um, I was earning a man's wage. I mean, most people in Stoke-on-Trent, most women worked in the pottery industry. It was led by women, totally. As the years went by, the women made the, the, the way further in, in, on the pottery industry, definitely. But at first it was more male, male. I saw there was that progression route. Most of the supervisors, my immediate manager was a woman. And you think about the history of Stoke-on-Trent, don't you? And you think about, you know, some of the f most famous ceramicists like Clarice Cliff, you know, she was female. So I think 
the, you could see that progression route. But like I said, I think the women did run the show there. Well, when I went back for the second study, 2006 to 2007, one of the reasons I wanted to go back was I knew all these pottery factories were closing, but there was hardly anything about it in the newspapers at all. It was almost forgotten that it, it was happening. And I'd been told what was happening as well from somebody I knew who was from the potteries. And I thought, well, I'm going to go back and, and talk to them about how they see what's happening. And then, of course, compared to the 1980s, you, you really couldn't walk very far without seeing a, a pot, pot bank. They were everywhere. It was the heart and soul of Stoke-on-Trent, the pottery industry. So I got there to find people, they'd all lost their jobs. What was very sad, I think, was that it was as if people hadn't left. They were still living in the area. But the landscape had changed so much. So many landmarks had gone. And it was almost as if they felt displaced in the place that they had felt they belonged. Now I went round the Spode factory in Stoke, I think it was about the day before it closed, and the paintresses were just packing up. And, and one woman called across to me, we have been thrown on the scrap heap. And that was the feeling. You know, they'd worked hard, they'd been loyal, they had their skills, they, they, you know, it was a major export industry and so on. And they'd just been thrown on the scrap heap. These skills are now seen to be obsolete. And people who have craft skills, that's their livelihood. They get, these have been passed on from generation to generation to generation, you know. The pottery just goes back hundreds of years. I mean, pottery was made uh, in the area we now know as Stoke-on-Trent in Roman times. And all of this just, that was it, as if it didn't matter. The idea that there wouldn't be a pottery industry in Stoke-on-Trent. It was a bit like somebody saying, you know, cats can talk. It was so unimaginable that it could ever happen. It was huge. It really affected the whole of the city. Um, we were given uh, options because of, of the, it was sinking ship, basically, and we were given the options to do a computer course. So we had to have, we could stay over of an evening and we had a guy come in and he'd show us all, just to give people different skills because they knew that the industry was folding, basically. It was a case of, oh, fancy making them redundant. I wonder what's going to happen next. But the job was still there. So one of us used to have to pick that job up before we could do ours. And it got us feeling a little bit peeved because we were doing the job that was still there and yet they'd made the person redundant who was supposed to be doing it. And it, it just, it didn't feel the same then. And then you'd go down to four days a week, which at first we thought, oh, this is great, this is, we can go away at weekends, oh, this is good, this is good. But when it come to three days a week, that wasn't so good. They brought a council in because it affected people that much. In fact, when I said I'd take somebody else's redundancy, I actually went back to the, the office and said, I can't go, I can't go. And they said, don't be silly to think this factory will shut down when you are there. And it was just because it was so part, so much part of my life, it was, I just couldn't handle it. And they said, well, we have fetched a counsellor in and he's seeing one or two other people, would you like to see him? So I said, oh yeah. Um, but lo and behold, it did shut down two years later. <laughs> I think when, when the, these ladies lost the jobs, you, they felt that like you weren't needed anymore. It was, you were so proud of what you did that all of a sudden it was, it was ripped away from you and, and you just weren't needed anymore because we played a, a very, very important role in, in producing for the area all this beautiful pottery. Um, and we were all proud of what we did, and we did it well. And it was just like, you, you felt a bit lost. I 
think it is a creative job, even right down to the shop floor. Even, even say a handle, and person who puts handles on mugs. It's, it's all skillful. And it wasn't just earning the money, you know, it was also to do with, I, I felt as though I was doing something good. You know, I think I, I thought I was doing something beautiful. It was going off to wonderful countries around the world, you know, and all of that. I used to go home every day and I used to think I've done a fantastic job, you know, I've just, it's been lovely all day. They've paid, paid me money for it and I've had probably one of the biggest laughs going with all my friends. It's our heritage, it's people's livelihoods and jobs. We're the best people to do it. Stoke-on-Trent, that's where it came from, so. And I think really, uh, we should be building on that heritage. I, I was always very proud because I'd always got that sense of Stoke-on-Trent is so special regarding the, the skills and the talents of the local people who we didn't realise how talented and artistic we, we, we were, but we all really were. So I was very proud of that, always was and always will be. Yes, it was, it's, it's a very special place, very unique place, Stoke-on-Trent, for that reason. I wouldn't change anything. And if I could, I would go back tomorrow. I could cry when I think about it. I totally miss it. I miss, I miss the camaraderie, I miss the fun, I miss just the laugh that we used to have on there, you know? It was really good fun. And when I go travelling around the world and you see a piece that you've perhaps done, and it's got your mark, because you used to put your mark on the bottom. That's a bit special. So yeah, it was in Australia once and I picked up a piece, got my mark on, I did that. So I'm proud, of course I'm proud, yeah, very proud. How did you first start working in the ceramic industries? I started straight from school. I wrote a letter asking for a job uh, in the unbanding and I got it straight away and I've been here 40 years next month. So what was the factory floor like to work on when you first started here? Very old fashioned, like put work on boards and they had stillages and everything and you had to wheel them out, yeah. Very old fashioned, really. I mean, in my job, personally, there's been like jealousy because it was piecework at the time. Um, because there was mainly women, the men like, didn't like the fact that the women probably in in a bit more, or maybe saying there was favouritism and what you, you know, your, your job entailed. But just get on with it, don't you? Yeah, ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was piecework better paid jobs than obviously your friends leaving school and stuff by working on the potlucks? Yeah, because like you say, piecework is is your individual choice. You know, you could earn it if you want, yeah, if you yeah, wanted, definitely. if it if it was there, you could earn it. You know, if probably if you had a bad night the night before, you probably wouldn't do <laughs> do, do do as much. But yeah, you'd, it was you'd want to do more, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it'd be worth it's it at the end of it. There's an incentive there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Was it like you got more for doing the piece work yeah. than yeah. if you didn't do yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. The more count you did, the, the more, more you got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How important do you think the role has always been of women in the ceramic industry? At first, the menial jobs wouldn't get done by men, no, would they? No, no. Um, um, more men, some men are coming more to the industry now and wanting to paint. Yes. It was like we're getting male people who want to paint, like in your job. Yeah. And we've had people on the machines who want to learn it, but I think it's more, I shouldn't really say more women yeah. enjoy the painting side, don't you? Mm. But I think the women now are widespread. I mean, when I first started, the men just worked on the kiln. Yeah, but... Every other job was done by a woman, even the big making machines. So what do you think opportunities for women working in the ceramic industry are now and going on into the future? There's a lot of interesting jobs in the decorating and all over the factory. I mean, you, we don't see half the stuff that we do anyway, do we? No. Some of it's really new to us, what yeah. we see. Yes. You know, it's like your job, isn't it? Yeah. Men and women now do the same job, so if you want to do that job, there's nothing stopping you, male or female. You think pop banks will carry on. Yeah. I know there's reduced pop banks, but there's always going to be a need for 
yeah. tableware yeah. and everything, yeah. yeah, pottery. Yeah. Are you proud that you've worked in the ceramic industry? It's, it's nice to see the finished yeah. product, what isn't it, and what you've done. Yeah. yeah, every time you go out to some teacher, you're turning the wear over. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, very proud, yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been in it as long as we no, have, really, would no, we? No, no, no. Clay College is a response to the decline of uh, training in universities. Basically over the last 10-15 years the practical side of ceramics training has basically disappeared. What we want to do is get back to the sort of the old days of the old HND courses say 30 years ago where it was a much more rounded training. It's a challenge actually. Clay is a, is a very versatile material, but it's also a very challenging material. That's why I've um, come to Clay College, because to realise the vision that I have, there's a whole base of skills behind that, that it takes time to, to build those skills. And I think the, the amazing quality of clay and, and the fabulousness of clay really is that it's such a direct relationship between the maker and the material. I think that women in the pottery industry have been one of the most important factors because this industry has always been dominated by female labour. When I've talked to people about inspirational people in the industry, if you ask the average person to name a ceramic designer, they will invariably come up with somebody like Clarice Cliff. I can't think of a particular male designer that has the reputation of somebody like Clarice Cliff. Ceramics, from day one, was female dominated. And in every single culture where there's potting, it is invariably led by women. With the exception of the introduction of the potter's wheel. As soon as there was a machine, the men took over. But that's changed now. You know, there are as many female throwers as there are male throwers. So I think we're very much uh, a process of equality. In today's society, there's a lot more consciousness developing about what people are buying. The, the age of consumerism has reached a massive um, influx and everything's become cheap and disposable. And there's now a growth in people being more conscious about what they're purchasing. Coupled with the um, recent, for the first time I think, real mass interest in reducing plastics. And then therefore, there, there's a real, there's more of a desire to actually buy products that are going to last longer and throughout their life. So I think there's a, a real special role for ceramics in that area. As technology grows, there's actually many um, components that are using ceramics and also, I mean, everybody um, is aware of dentistry and some of the breakthroughs with ceramics and dentistry. So it's not just a part of the past, it's a part of the future and the technical um, growth. Many of the more creative people in, in ceramics, right through from industrial into studio and fine art conceptual, if you like, are women. When more and more women started to come into art school, you know, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, you saw a, ri a, a real rise in inspirational ceramics, a move away from the sort of rustic brown and boring and how big a pot you could throw. It became more about good quality design, the use of colour, shape and form. You know, I think many, many inspirational uh, potters, both in the past and in the future, uh, will be women. The ceramics industry is so much more than just pottery. It includes construction materials, technical ceramics, refractories, 
and supplies to the industry. Ceramics are used in all sorts of things like aircraft, cars and artificial hips. It's also important to take the time to celebrate the variety of women doing fantastic roles across the sector whether they're the designers, but also the scientists, the engineers, the business leaders, those working to improve health, safety and environmental standards, those publicising the sector. We've all got something to contribute about this fantastic industry. It's about inspiring the next generation of women, of girls at school, to realise that they're an amazing variety of roles in the sector that they can take on too and help the sector continue to thrive and grow. Myself and a very small team of designers, um, we create the pattern uh, design uh, for the clay, which is basically the face of Moorcroft. When you think about all the big names, most of them are women, Doris Cliff, Susie Cooper, Charlotte Reed, continuing on from that, it's a real honour. Here, um, over 80% of the workforce are female, not just designing, it's, um, it's, it's from shop floor to MD. I mean, we're quite capable as women, <laughs> and um, and so yeah, it's very much across the board. There's so many different areas. Um, you know, even for young people trying to get into the industry, there are so many different areas to to go into. I'd encourage anybody to come and work in the industry. And you've got to obviously love it. You've got to be creative. You've got to have the heart for it. But it's a very rewarding place to work in, and there are so many opportunities for women. That ceramic backstamp, the made in England, the made in Stoke, that is a mark of quality. And also we've got so much skill here. We've got hundreds of years of, of skilled people working in the industry. So much beauty has come out of Stoke-on-Trent and I'm, yeah, I'm very proud to be a part of that. Stoke is ceramic, ceramics is Stoke. In its heyday, the ceramics industry in Stoke-on-Trent employed over 100,000 people. By 2009, only 9,000 jobs remained. There are still challenges, but there are also many reasons to be positive about a future for ceramics in Stoke-on-Trent. The city remains at the heart of ceramics production worldwide, and Stoke-on-Trent is home to major international brands, Steelite, Wedgwoods and Churchill, Contemporary success stories such as Emma Bridgewater, the beautiful art pottery of Moorcroft, and a host of other bespoke artisan potteries and craft potters. Here we celebrate the beauty that has been created by pottery workers across Stoke on Trent, and the influence and importance of women in the workplace, the passion and the pride of the pieces they've produced, the friendships they've made, and the memories they've shared will live on forever. It wasn't like work. It was it was fun. Fun and we achieved something and at the end the end result was, was beautiful. It was just family. There, there was no strangers, there was nobody above us, there was nobody below us. We were all together. It was all just good, innocent just fun, just just a laugh, a laugh a minute. Friends, friends and all that went on, the, the happiness, the joy, that's what I miss, family and friends there.